Hello, I'm Jeffrey Williams, and welcome to Too Late for the Gods. In a recent video on a channel called Ask Anything, linked below, Bernardo Castro attempts to answer his critics uh, of his self-described metaphysical idealism. I thought I was done with Kastrup, having debunked his pseudo-philosophy in two videos and in long conversations with his supporters on Facebook and uh, the Kastrup discussion board, all to the point where many of his followers asked Kastrup to discuss or debate my arguments with me. Of course, to no avail. His only responses were to ignore me, decline in writing to appear on video with me, block me on Twitter, leave and denounce his own discussion board due to improper opinions being expressed when my participation threatened him there. And now, this, his evasion and strawmanning of my arguments on this Ask Anything video. It begins with a distorted depiction of my position from someone going by the name of Rahman Panda Products. I found this, I think... On a YouTube channel, too late for the gods. Um, the summary of the question is: there is no evidence of transpersonal consciousness that can stand up to the uh, atheistic refutation of it. Therefore, idealism is unfounded. So it's rather <laughs> a, it's more a st statement than anything else. But <laughs> this is a... <laughs> yeah. Okay. Should, do you want me to reply to this? Sure, yeah. Nay. Nee, sure. <laughs> I'll take it. Okay. Panda Products reduces all of the arguments I have made to a simplistic claim I never made. There is no evidence of transpersonal consciousness that can stand up to the atheistic refutation of it. We will see Castro, who knows better, try to laugh off this obvious straw man. First, atheism never entered into my argument. Second, Transpersonal consciousness has many vague meanings. What I argue against specifically is consciousness as what Kastrup calls the ontological primitive or existing other than emergent in a living organism. Transpersonal consciousness is a term that obfuscates rather than clarifies. This gives Kastrup an opportunity to ignore my arguments as a simplistic and absurd statement. I've linked below to my two presentations where I go into detailed critiques of Kastrup's theses for those who are interested. Kastrup responds with four claims of evidence for elemental consciousness, all of which are far more deserving of laughter. The first is a lot of obfuscatory smoke about transpersonal psychology. Okay. Um there's plenty of evidence for transpersonal consciousness. Um, there is a whole field of psychology called transpersonal psychology, has been around for decades and has, you know, voluminous uh, literature. There is indeed um, a great deal written about transpersonal psychology, but we shouldn't mistake quantity for validation. In the 19th century, there was a great deal written about phrenology, not so much today. We should also take into account that much of what is written about transpersonal psychology is critical and dismissive, which remains a small and esoteric pursuit. Of particular note is the vague and contradictory definitions of the pursuit, most of which have little or nothing to do with consciousness as the cosmic ontological primitive. It includes topics such as mysticism, shamanism, spiritual fulfillment, meditation, self-development, oneness with the world, and religious conversion. Consciousness as ontological primitive, although appearing at times, is not a central concept in transpersonal psychology, and Kostrup's claim that it contains voluminous evidence of such is not true. In fact, there is much doubt that it provides evidence of anything at all. In 2011, Professor Paul F. Cunningham wrote in A Primer on Transpersonal Psychology, 
quote, philosophers have criticized transpersonal psychology because its metaphysics is naive and epistemology is undeveloped. Multiplicity of definitions and lack of operationalization of many of its concepts has led to a conceptual confusion about the nature of transpersonal psychology itself. That is, the concept is used differently by different theorists and means different things to different people. Biologists have criticized transpersonal psychology for its lack of attention to biological foundations of behavior and experience. And from my perspective, most importantly, physicists have criticized transpersonal psychology for inappropriately accommodating physics concepts as explanations of consciousness, end quote. Practitioners of transpersonal psychology petitions the American Psychological Association to institute a new dedicated division to the field, which was rejected due to its unscientific nature. In addition, it is all but ignored at major universities. Kastrup's laughter hides a lot of insecurity in this position. I will here reiterate, there is no persuasive evidence for elemental consciousness arising from transpersonal psychology. He then moves to an even more laughable argumentation from psychedelics. Um, if you want to experience it yourself, deep psychedelic states are profoundly transpersonal. Um, and I don't mean by these people who take mushrooms or LSD and go to the park uh, to enjoy the colors. That, that's not a psychedelic trip. This is not even the atrium of a psychedelic trip. Uh, you're just putting your toes on, on the bee, on, in the water, if you know what I mean. But when you jump into the water, uh, many psychonauts would describe the experience at certain part of the experience as transcending humanness. Um, it, when you get past that, you become aware that you're no longer human. Um, your humanness is left behind. Some, some describe, it, describe it as punching through a kind of flower, going through a chrysanthemum. Terence McKenna used to talk about it as a chrysanthemum. And if you punch through it, if you go beyond the chrysanthemum, then you are in transpersonal space and you are no longer human, you are no longer localized uh, in space-time. And that's a very palpable, lived, concrete experience that is, epistemically speaking, above any kind of uh, theoretical abstraction and conceptualization. So that's the first answer. We need to recognize right up front, he's trying to argue from hallucinogenics, which, you know, caused hallucinations. He's trying to treat hallucinations as evidence and even gives us this gem of a statement, quote, and that's a very palpable, concrete, lived experience, epistemically speaking above any theoretical abstraction or conceptualization, end quote. It isn't palpable or concrete, it's a hallucination. It might seem real to him as hallucinations tend to seem, but it certainly isn't concrete or palpable. Just the opposite. It's a sensation without correlation to any palpable cause. And with what only the very gullible could swallow, he ends with the pompous absurdity that, epistemically speaking, it's above any abstraction or conceptualization. Well, epistemically speaking, that's complete nonsense. If you were talking about a non-reductive aesthetic experience of something presented in the real world, he might have a point. But what he is talking about here is even less grounded or palpable than in any abstraction. And just to engulf us in more mystical fog, he tells us uh, we are then no longer human. Really? What are we then? Or the nonsense about punching through a flower into a non-human space behind space and time. Well, what kind of space might be with no space or time? Yet he seems totally unembarrassed spewing such, such sophomoric absurdities. I'm very familiar with the experience of psychedelics, both LSD and mushrooms, and I know from this experience that what happens is your ability to construct a coherent and reductive representational construct of the world recedes. 
giving you the straight confusion of the world behind our daily artificial representational construct. And with the absence of reduction, the, fic the fiction of internal-external dichotomy dissipates, leaving you aware of the interconnect interconnectedness of everything. I even suggest that without that experience, you can't authentically discuss consciousness. But there is absolutely nothing in that experience that gives evidence of a primal consciousness underlying all reality. Just the opposite. It shows how tenuous and reductive consciousness is. He then moves to metaphysics of the gaps. Now, even if that, was, that were not the case, even if there were no, there wasn't, there were no evidence of transpersonal states, which scientifically we have plenty of. The literature is, you cannot read the entire literature yourself in a lifetime, let's put it that way. But let's, so this person just doesn't know what he's talking about or she. Um, but let's, just for the sake of argument, pretend that that weren't the case. Let's pretend that there is absolutely no evidence, scientific or otherwise, for transpersonal states. Is the conclusion still valid? No, it doesn't follow from, from the premise. It, it's a non sequitur because you have to compare idealism with the alternatives. Uh, um, if you compare idealism with uh, constitutive panpsychism, there is no evidence that uh, fundamentally separate minds combine uh, to, force, to form seemingly unitary higher level minds. It's pure uh, uh, theoretical speculation. Um, let's now compare it to physicalism. Uh, there is no evidence whatsoever. There are only assumptions, but there is no evidence whatsoever that purely physical systems, exhaustively definable in, or characterizable in terms of quantities alone, have ever produced the qualities of experience. There is no evidence that any computer has experienced the redness of red. The, the, to postulate that that's what happens is a theoretical abstraction. It's totally independent of evidence. Um, so if, even if there were no evidence for transpersonal states, and there's plenty of it, but even if there weren't, on this base alone, idealism would still be entirely on par with physicalism and constitutive panpsychism. He starts by repeating his false claim of voluminous evidence for idealism, then claims that even if this voluminous evidence didn't exist, it wouldn't matter. His claim that panpsychism has no evidence is true. It's merely a metaphysical conjecture. Physicalism also has not yet explained consciousness, but it does have the advantage of staying within the only thing we know to exist and avoids the emptiness of metaphysical speculation. If there is an answer to be found, that's where it is. He also misrepresents the better physicalist theories of consciousness, which have nothing at all to do with machines being conscious. He concludes that since other approaches are no better than idealism, idealism would still be entirely on par with physicalism and panpsychism. All that would mean, if true, is that we have no reason to take any of them seriously, as all would be meaningless and empty conjecture. From that, no honest person would then proclaim consciousness to be the ontological primitive. There would be no evidence to support that claim, but rather one meaningless assertion among several others. It gets worse, though, when he attempts to demonstrate we do have physical evidence for idealism. Now let's take a step further. Let's look at more indirect evidence. Um, there is no evidence for combination. There is no evidence for emergence of qualities from quantities. Is there elements, evidence for decomposition? Lo and behold, there is. Even if there were no evidence for transpersonal states, there is hardcore neuroimaging and clinical scientific evidence that minds can decompose into multiple centers of awareness. So even if the premise of this person's question were true, and it's obviously not for anybody who has ever even glanced at the literature, even then idealism would still be the best of the options we have conceived 
thus far. So no, this, this, this is not a good criticism. <laughs> Let's not waste more time on this. <laughs> We see him bluster and laugh his way through a nonsensical claim of indirect evidence that the brain compartmentalizes consciousness is no evidence at all for transpersonal consciousness. It merely means that the brain pieces together disparate elements of sense data. He leaves unexplained just how what he calls decomposition is even indirect evidence. But perhaps he has in mind his notion of dissociation, where human consciousness is said to be dissociated individuation of a cosmic consciousness. The problem is that remains a totally unsupported metaphysical assertion. We have no evidence of consciousness outside living organisms or that we are dissociations of one cosmic consciousness. That is every bit as ridiculous as what he ridiculed in panpsychism. He gets himself trapped in a circle when he claims that the human brain's ability to dissociate indicates it itself is dissociation from a cosmic consciousness. And we know that a cosmic consciousness exists because we dissociate. If we were to follow his method here, however, we do get a glimpse of how it is more likely to be emergent within physicality. Something cannot be ontologically primitive if it derives from and is dependent on something else. On Twitter, he unwittingly acknowledged that consciousness depends on energy in a dispute with someone over the possibility of consciousness in a computer. He rightly pointed out that without ATP, there can be no consciousness. As I pointed out to him, ATP is what enables energy to fuel the brain. If you cut off energy, consciousness disappears into nothing. No energy, no consciousness. Demonstrating energy as primary to consciousness. For that, he uh, ungratefully blocked me. But bluster, blocking, and evasion is his way. He almost never debates or discusses his pseudo-philosophy with any competent opponent. The few times he has, as with Sabina Hossenfelder, he got his ass handed to him and cried over his butt hurt for weeks. He recently had a similar meltdown over an encounter with another pseudo-philosopher named Chris Langen on another channel. And then there, there was his endless whining over Sam Harris's refutation of his claims from NDEs. His response to me was, first of all, to ignore the arguments I have made, although he is fully aware of them, as, even as he pretends not to be. Then to falsely claim voluminous evidence from a pseudoscience, argue from hallucination, and ramble some nonsense about decomposition. Kastrup is not a serious thinker, but rather someone in search of a cult. And sadly, there are many lost souls looking, looking for simplistic answers. I again repeat an invitation to Mr. Kastrup to discuss our differences, but that is not what cult leaders do. I also welcome anybody who wants to defend Kastrup onto this channel for discussion.